Amen. Take the word of God with me, please, and we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the Bible there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the New Testament. <clears throat> Bible says in verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me as I preach on this powerful, important topic Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit, use me, and Lord, I pray that you would bless these folks here today as we think about you and the reason that we're here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a powerful passage of scripture 1 Corinthians 15 is. Without question, it's, it's possibly, I mean, it's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Uh, it's the resurrection chapter. And it makes me think about what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. If you would turn over there, hold your place in 1 Corinthians. We'll go back there in just a moment. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says this in verse number 8. The Bible says this, Paul says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. As he speaks about the things he had in his previous religion, in the Jews' religion as a Pharisee and so forth, he says, you know what? I have gained Christ, and I want to know everything about Jesus Christ. And that is a Christian. That is the way we're supposed to be. This book right here is about Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In 66 books, and we want to know, you want to know about Christ in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You get to Matthew, you have him named. But we find out in the New Testament that the Old Testament was about Jesus. The redemption plan was set, you see that right there in Genesis chapter 3, with the bruising of the head of the serpent. Makes me think about what Paul said. He said, I want to know the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He says, I want to win Christ. In verse number nine, he says, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. Now, when he was a Pharisee, when he was uh, living in the Jews religion, he believed in work salvation. He thought that his good deeds and the keeping of the law was going to save him. Of course, that was a twisting of the Old Testament scriptures. By the way, Salvation has always been by grace through faith. And nobody ever once kept the law to get into heaven. But you know what? They walked around with their long robes. Jesus rebuked them. And he, they would walk around to be seen of men. And they uh, believed that they were going to go to heaven because of their own righteousness. But Paul said, I want to be found not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. In verse 10 he goes on and says that I may know him. He wants to know that, have a knowledge of Christ, but he wants to know Christ personally. And he wants to know this, and the power of his resurrection. 
and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So he says, I want to know Jesus. I want to know all about him. And the way we know Christ is to read the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The word of God contains the words of God. And so we need to, we need to know his book. And he says, I want to know about the power of his resurrection. There is power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we are going to know that power very personally one day because everyone who's accepted Jesus Christ is going to personally partake in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. And then he says this. He says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Jesus went through a lot of sufferings. He became a man. He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. He was treated horribly. And he, of course, told his disciples that they, they hate me and they're going to hate you. He said, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have suffering and problems in this world. And Paul said, is saying, he says, you know what? I want to be willing to suffer. I want to identify with Christ no matter what comes, whether I'm thrown in prison. And that's why he said, I'm willing to go to Rome also. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And then he said, being made conformable unto his death. He wants to be, he's be, is willing to die. You know, he didn't count his life dear unto himself, the Bible says. And then he says, if by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. And so what we're going to talk about to, to this morning and this afternoon is the power of the resurrection. The power of his resurrection that's found in verse number uh, 10. But before I move from this text, I want to just be very clear and explicit on the gospel for just a moment. Many people in verse 11 will uh, you know, take one of these verses like this and say, well, here, Paul's trying to attain. He's trying to work his way into getting the resurrection of the dead. But that's not what the Bible says, is it? As a matter of fact, that's the exact opposite uh, of what the passage is teaching. What is he saying there when he says that he wants to attain the resurrection of the dead? Well, obviously, some people will like to twist this and say, well, hey, he's working for his salvation. No. No, what he's saying is that the resurrection is a huge motivator for the Christian life. He wants to attain. He goes on to explain what this is talking about in the next few verses. But he's saying he wants to do his best so that he can please the Lord when he comes back. Jesus is coming again, by the way. The resurrection happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. We'll see that a little bit later in the sermon. And at that second coming of, uh, of Jesus, the dead shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall be called up together to meet the Lord in the air. And by the way, we'll forever be with the Lord, praise God. And he's going at that moment in time, at that time when he takes us to heaven, there is going to be a day of rewards. The Bible says this in Revelation 22, verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work uh, as his work shall be. His reward is with him. Christ is coming and he's going to reward our works. That's why we're, we don't want to be ashamed of him, at his coming, the Bible says. And notice what the, the motivation here is in verse 12, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, as we see the, the resurrection and the power of the resurrection and the coming of Christ being a major motivator in the Christian life, he says, not as though I had already attained, he's continuing to that thought, he says, I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead, he goes on and says, not as though I already attained, either uh, were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. He's like, I've got a goal. The Lord you know, has called me to do a work. I want to do my best. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. But this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He set his eyes on a goal and he says, you know what? When the Lord comes back, I want to I get a prize. I want to get the prize. I want the Lord to say, well done, now good and faithful servant. 
I want to be found worthy. I want to be found uh, doing my best and have done my best. Not that any of us could attain perfection in this life. Not that any of us could ever work our way in and, and be good enough to go into heaven because even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before the Lord. The Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So he's not working for to get into heaven. He's working to attain a prize, to, to earn some rewards, some crowns in heaven, if you will. And if you go back, you, just to be very clear on this, go back to verse number nine to just show this very clearly. And I'm just, I wanted to get the gospel in here and talk about the gospel for just a minute. And I thought this was a powerful way to do it. Look at verse number nine. And he says, and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, if it was of works, according to the passage of Scripture, Paul had checked a lot of the boxes, didn't he? I mean, he was, he was keeping the law. He was of the tribe of David. He was doing all of these things. He was uh, taught by Gamaliel and all of this, and passage teaches. But he says, you know what? I am not going to be found in my own righteousness. And so turn over to Romans chapter 4. Keep this verse in mind. He says, and, and be, I want to be found in him. When the Lord comes back, he's going to bring a reward to those who are in him. You don't get a reward. Heaven is not a reward. You don't work your way into heaven. You don't be good enough to get, uh, live a good enough life to get into heaven. We are all sinners. All we do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to him and he makes us righteous. We are found in his righteousness. We're made holy and able to go to heaven. But Paul is saying simply, like, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve the resurrection of the dead. But I'm going to do my best to attain it. Like, I, I'm going to make my life count for Jesus. When he comes, I want him to say, you know what, I'm not ashamed of that guy. He did his best. He's not perfect, but he did his best. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining the flesh, hath found? For Abraham, uh, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham did some good works. He, he, I'm sure he was well rewarded in heaven. But you know what? He didn't have anything to glory of when it comes to salvation. The Bible says, where, where does he have the glory? He has, he, he can, he can, people can talk about him today. People can read about him in Hebrews chapter 11. But they can't, he can't say, I got into heaven because of my good works. No, the Bible says he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now somebody says, somebody might say, well, hey, you know, you got to, you know, Believe and have works. Well, the Bible actually says in verse number four, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. If you're working for it, it's not a gift. And it's not the grace of God. God has given us a gift and that gift is found in grace and grace is where we don't deserve heaven at all. Not one ounce of us, but he has uh, made us worthy. And he has given us that gift of eternal life through Jesus and what he did on the cross. Bible goes on to say, um, verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You know, the thief on the cross, did he do any works before he got into heaven? He just believed, didn't he? He said, he said Remember me, Lord, when thou cometh into thy kingdom. And he said, Well, he said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says we have to do to be saved. We could never attain the resurrection. And it's just sad to me to see people deceived, going to hell, thinking that they're a good person. You ask them out on soul winning, if you were to die today, are you 100%? Man, I am. I know I'm going to heaven. Well, what do you believe a person has to do to be, go to heaven? Well, I, I believe I'm a good person. I believe you have to go to church and be a good person and so forth. Listen, that is not what we do to go to heaven. You might get some rewards for serving the Lord. You might get some prizes. You might be found faithful. You might be found a, 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 a good steward, but you're not saved by works. The Bible goes on to say in verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of, of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Listen, my friends, 
You and I, if you're saved today, God imputed or gave to your account what? His righteousness, His holiness without your works, period. When God looks at you, He sees a forgiven person. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's no sins on your account. When the books of the works of the damned in Revelation chapter 20 are opened and people are thrown into hell, those who are saved are not in that book. No sins are found in that book. But, the, but the, their names are in the Lamb's book of life. Verse number uh, 7, the Bible says, saying, blessed are, blessed are they, notice this, whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. You say, well, what is that talking about? Well, that means that you see are that is your present sins, right? Those whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And I believe that, con that contains not just your past and your present, but also you, your future sins, the body of your sins. Mm -hmm. And we'll see, the, we'll see that in verse 8. He says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And thank God, that's what salvation is. We come to Christ, we realize we can't work we can't work our way in. We don't have anything to offer. We just say, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. I believe on you. And what he does is he takes our old sin. Uh, and he just takes our, the body of our sin, our criminal record, our sin record, and he throws it away and he imputes righteousness onto us. He, he justifies us. He gives us a clean record. And that's an amazing thing. So the fact is that many think, people think we have to work or be righteous in their own actions to get to heaven, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is actually found in 1 Corinthians 15. Flip back there if we could. 1 Corinthians 15. In the opening verses of this passage, you'll see the apostle plainly declares the gospel. And, he, and by the way, the gospel, word gospel means good news. Amen. Glad tidings. Good tidings of, uh, of great joy. Amen. And so... Uh, that's what the word means. 1 Corinthians 15. And thank God it's good news. I was talking about this the other week. I, you know, I, a couple years ago, I preached a whole series on Catholicism. And um, I, you know, I was passionate about it. I had gotten a guy saved and he, uh, that, that, uh, out of Catholicism and spent quite a bit of time on soul winning, talking to him. And, and um, I, I gave him the gospel. I, I got very specific with some of the things that he believed and everything. And you know, at the end of it, uh, he... You know, he, I said, now, does this make sense to you? I was going back through some of the things he had said at the beginning. And I said, hey, do you see here that now, now it's not a system of works. You're not saved through a church or sacraments or anything like that. And I said, you're just saved by trusting in Jesus as your personal Savior. And, I, and he goes, yeah, I see that now. And I said, what do you think about that? He goes, well, I like, I like that way better than what I was taught in the Catholic Church. I sure do. And his wife is just smiling. He had married a Baptist. And uh, talked to her afterwards, and she was just so excited that her husband got saved. And uh, he did. He believed, put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God. It's, it's simple. It's easy. It's good news. And the people that think that, that you have to, you know, show contrition and cry for your sins and have penance and uh, work off your sins and live this life your whole life, and you still may not make it in, that's a hopeless, helpless situation. They don't understand the grace of God. That's not God's grace. That's not good news. That's not, I'm going to tell you, that's the, a poor version of good news, in my opinion. I, look, I like the good news of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I like the good news of believe and his righteousness is imputed to my account without my righteousness, without my good deeds. That's what I like. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By the which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, how, uh, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to to the scriptures. What does this mean that he died for our sins? He died for the body of our sins, the whole, the whole of our sins. And all of our sins, the Bible tells us that his, our sins were put on his body. And the Lord poured out his wrath upon Jesus in, in the body on the cross. That's what happened. And he took our sins in his own body on the tree. And you know the Bible says that he was buried and that he, was, he rose again the third day according to 
to the scriptures. So the Lord died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again. And that's how we're saved. How, how are we saved, by the way? We're saved by believing in what he did on that cross and that he buried and was rose again. That's how, we, that's how we're saved. And believing on him for eternal salvation. Believing that that was enough for our salvation. Amen. So if you were to say, well, I have to live a good life. Well, why wasn't Jesus' death on the cross enough? Why wasn't his burial enough? Why wasn't his resurrection enough? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. We believe that he truly died for every sin. Even the sins we haven't committed yet. The, our past, our present, and our future sins. They were all in the future on the cross. He was buried and rose again the third day. And by putting our faith in him, we can have eternal life. Our body may die, but our soul will live forever. And we'll get a new glorified body at his coming. And we'll be like Christ in that way. You say, well, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, the Bible says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. He said, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand. And he goes on to say, even to them that believe on his name. In John 3, 18, the Bible says, he that believeth on him is not condemned. When you get saved, you put your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross for you, you are not condemned anymore, my friends. The condemnation is gone. It, they, you have accepted Jesus' gift on the cross and his work on the cross, and you're not condemned. Period. There is no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Now, why are people condemned that haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's simple. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Everyone in this world is either saved or lost, and the lost people need to hear about Jesus because they're condemned, and if they were to die today, they'll go to hell. And so it's our job to go out and tell them about, the, about what he did for us on the cross. The only reason that anybody goes to hell is they, they don't believe on Jesus. He made it easy. He made it available. He made it there for everyone. He died for everyone. So how, how long are we saved? Well, it's very simple. Jesus in John 3.16 called it a, uh, everlasting life. In John 5.24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. No future damnation, no future sins can condemn you to hell. They're all forgiven and notice this, but is passed from death unto life. Uh, we're born again. John 6, 40 says, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. Amen. That's the will of God. John 6, 47 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And that's the gospel. It's the good news. It's the theme of the, this chapter is that Jesus physically died. His body died. But he rose up three days later, and all of us are going to physically die. But you know what? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? <laughs> we'll get to that a little bit later this afternoon. But like Jesus, we won't stay dead. We'll get a new body when he comes again. Now, how important is this doctrine of the re uh, resurrection for Christians? How, how important is this doctrine for the whole world? Well, had he not risen from that tomb, his death would mean very little to us today. It probably wouldn't mean anything to us. Jesus had to rise from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, if he isn't alive forevermore then where would we be? We, he would just be another person, just like everybody else, but he's not. So the significance, of, number one, the significance of the resurrection, I want to point this out, is that Jesus' uh, resurrection was totally unique. Everyone in history has died, and my friends, you and I will die unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes in our lifetime. A few have died, and then God raised them up to life again. But no one besides Jesus has ever risen from the dead, never to die again. And that's the difference that we're talking about. 
In 2 Kings 4, Elisha raised up a child from the dead, the child from the dead. Praise God. I mean, you love that, these stories, right? In 2 Kings 13, a dead man was dropped onto the body of Elisha, and he, he comes back to life when he touches the bones. In Matthew 9, Jesus raised uh, the ruler's daughter from the dead. In Luke 7, Jesus raised the widow's son, uh, uh, only son from the dead. In John 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. In Acts 9, Peter raised Tabitha from the dead. And, uh, you know, did you know that when Jesus rose from the dead, turn over to Matthew 27. When Jesus rose from the dead, a whole bunch of graves were open of them that believed and came out and walked around and, and all of that. That's another miracle and sign. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine this thing? Matthew 27, 52, And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine you're there, you know, maybe a widow, and all of a sudden your husband walks in the front door? You know, it's like, we buried you like 10 years ago. What in the world? What's going on? Can you imagine some child comes back to life and comes in, comes home? This is an evidence of the resurrection. Many people saw these people. And while these are all amazing miracles, and I love that story uh, that, that around the resurrection of Christ, none of them compare to what Jesus did when he rose again. You see, uh, he conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered uh, the grave. He conquered all of that. Those people, you know, that those graves were open. Don't fill them. Don't get the backhoe and fill them back in, because they're going to die again one of those days. Don't sell the plot, because they're going to die again, right? They're going to use that one of those days. They may get a lease on life, a new lease on life, but you'll you can you can sell that place where Jesus laid. He'll never need it. <laughs> He'll never need it. They'll never kill him. Somebody had um, taken a, a shirt and it said. You know, what, what is the famous thing? Um, what would Jesus do? WWJD and some atheist on co the college campus in Knoxville had, you know, we want Jesus dead, you know. Well, good luck with that. As a matter of fact, you're going to be the one that's dying for all eternity. He rose again. Uh, totally unique from every other resurrection in history. He rose again the third day in the power of endless life. Uh, turn over to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. This is talking about Jesus, by the way. Jehovah's Witnesses hate Revelation 1. They twist it all up. But I'm telling you, this is Jesus. And it's clear. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And notice, it just clears up who it is, who it's talking about. I'm not going to go into deep doctrine on this. But I want you to see this in Revelation 1, 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid uh, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I ha and have the keys of hell and of death. My friend, as Christians, we don't have to fear. Fear not. He said, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and I'm alive forevermore. Praise God. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to give you just a couple of thoughts here as we look at this passage, talking about the significance of the resurrection, meaning that it was totally different than every other resurrected person in history. God rose, brought back to life uh, for a period of time. Jesus' resurrection uh, indicates a, a change and shows us that we can have everlasting life as well in a new glorified body. We're going to have a resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, the Bible says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, the, Sa the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And, of course, uh, they, they believed that there was no resurrection. It wasn't taught in the Old Testament. I, I preached a sermon a, while, a few years ago about... Uh, uh, the, Old the resurrection in the Old Testament. The Bible absolutely teaches uh, the resurrection in the Old Testament. But of course, uh, there were those here after Christ's resurrection saying there is no resurrection of the dead. Well, Paul is going to prove to them and say, listen, there is resurrection of the dead because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he's going to explain this to us here. Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not 
risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith also is also vain. Yea, and we were found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So his proof is that there's going to be a future resurrection because Jesus rose from the dead. And he is a witness. He's giving himself as a witness with the other apostles and many other people who saw Jesus in, the, in his resurrected form. And he goes on to say this in verse number 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only... We have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. So he's saying, listen, if we only have Christ in this life, and we don't have the, this hope of resurrection and eternal life and all of that, then we're miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He says, listen, you folks got something great coming because Christ was the first fruit. And at the harvest, you're going to be taken out. You're going to be harvested out. He was just the first fruits, and you all are going to be the rest. Okay? The Bible talks about the harvest, and he takes the wheat and separates the tares and so forth. That's what he's talking about there. That's, that's that resurrection rapture time. And he says this, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, when... You know, Adam and Eve had eternal life in the garden and they partook of that forbidden fruit and they had the knowledge of sin and so forth and they plunged the whole world into sin and, and so forth. The Bible says, and sin passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And now Christ, the second Adam, is our Redeemer and He's come that we might have everlasting life. He's fixed this issue. Okay. So as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And notice this, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they which are Christ at his coming. So when the Lord comes back, he's going to resurrect all the bodies. He's going to rapture out all the living and give them a glorified body. And the Bible goes on and says, Then cometh the end, when we, he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, which he, uh, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. So we're talking about the significance of the resurrection. You say, what is the significance? Well, uh, let's, look, let's look to the end of the chapter real quick, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The significance is that Jesus rose from the dead and he stayed alive. He's alive forevermore and our eternal life is tied to that. So let's jump down to verse number 50. He says, for, now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Okay? So, bodies aren't, th these earthly bodies are not, these corrupt bodies are not going to go into the kingdom of God. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You say, we're going to be changed? We're not all going to die? Yes, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So our change is, is, is going to happen at the resurrection. Now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When, if you were to die today, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, your soul will leave your body, and it will go to heaven to be with the Lord. That's a fact. But one day, He's coming again. And he's going to bring us with him. And he's going to give us a glorified body. He's going to, at that resurrection, he's going to resurrect the bodies. And he's going to give them a new glorified, incorruptible body. And we shall be 
changed. The change is going to happen so instantaneous. It'll be in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. You'll be, you'll be there in the soul, in the soul with the Lord, and then boom, you'll have a new body. Boom, just that fast. Dead is resurrected. It's not going to be a long drawn out thing. I saw as a kid, we saw some uh, thing about the rapture, and it was like a, uh, like it wasn't a Hollywood, but it was like a Christian movie, some silly cheesy Christian movie, and um, the grave opened up, and this guy just like a missile rocketed up out of the dirt up into the sky. It was the funniest thing ever. It was on a VHS tape. No, it's going to happen really fast. And uh, we're going to be changed. And the Bible says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So Jesus took on him a body that was corruptible. It, it was, he felt every pain. He suffered. I mean, he was hungry. I mean, when he fasted for 40 days, he felt it. Like, that was hard. That was why Satan was tempting him. You know, why don't you turn that rock into bread? You know, that kind of thing. He felt it. He, he felt every uh, time, I mean, when they nailed his hands, you know, to the, to, the, to the cross, when they whipped him, they did all of those things to him. He felt it in his body. But when he came back in a new glorified body, it was incorruptible. And they'll never kill him now. He's indestructible, right? And we're going to get that as well. This mortal body shall put on immortality. You know, a lot of people are looking for immortality today. You've got these guys, I think, wasn't it Bezos, Jeff Bezos with Amazon? There were several other really rich people uh, that, that, I mean, even going back to Walt Disney, I heard that Walt Disney put himself in a meat locker or something, froze himself so that he could, maybe they could cure him one of these days. Um, you know, they're going to have to cure freezer burn first, right? Um, but, uh, you know, these guys want to... These guys want to live forever. Bezos came out with a thing, Life Extension. He wants to, like, I forget the name of the company. Does anybody know the name of the company? It's like Eternal Life Company. He wants to try to live forever. You're not going to do that. You're not going to put your brain in a jar or upload your consciousness into a, uh, the cloud. All that stuff that, where these people try to live forever, some life extension technology. Look, the, the, the vaccine certainly not going to do it, okay? The COVID vaccine. It's not going to do it. If you want eternal life, it's really simple. You want a new, you want a glorified, immortal, you want to be an immortal? You know, you're not a vampire. That's not it. That's, that's evil Hollywood garbage. You want to be an immortal? Put your faith in Jesus Christ and you'll live forever. He says this. I love this. We'll close with this. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, in, uh, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? You say, man, I don't want to die. Death's not bad for a Christian. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But I've been forgiven, amen? But thanks be to God, which hath given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Christ arose. We are, we are going to be found, if you've trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, we're found in His righteousness. And you know what? We, we have a great motivation. Amen. I mean, we can look death right in the face. And say, you know what? You can kill my body, but you can't kill my soul. You can kill this body, but I'm getting a new one one day. And you won't be able to kill that one. Do your best. Thank God. The significance of the re resurrection is very, very much. And so let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I have a lot to say on the resurrection. I have run out of time here for the meal. Lord, I pray that you'd help me as I preach the rest of it this afternoon. But Lord, I just pray... Uh, that these folks here, Lord, would take some time today be, to be thankful, to be uh, just meditate upon these truths of the Word of God. Lord, it's, it's an amazing thing, Lord, to think about your resurrection and our resurrection to follow. We love you.